All right, we're back. We're with Rain Maida of Our Lady Peace. How are you today, Rain? I'm doing good. I'm in, I'm in uh, where am I? I'm in Boston. Boston. Okay, great. Yeah. So the tour has started. You, you'll be working your way out here to the West Coast. We're uh, excited to see you, and I know it's uh, always always new fans. It's exciting. As, as bands grow, it's always good to see the evolution of, like, you know, a couple different generations at least, you know, at the shows. Yeah, it's very cool. It's very cool. We're, we're at that point now where you, we are seeing like uh, newer fans come in, which is really cool. And I think it's good timing. You know, we have a bunch of music coming out, and um, yeah, it's, everything's good. Beautiful. Well, I know you go all the way back to the early '90s, coming out of Toronto. You know, Canada is a, a great place that nurtures the arts, and you know, a great uh, lover of music. But you're one of those few bands that was able to cross over into America and around you know, international territory. So take us back, you know, when you and Mike, you know, started to band, what was the what was the feeling? What were you guys what was your goal initially or common interest as you started? <laughs> I mean, you know, back then I don't know, the the goals were pretty small, right? It's like, hey, can we can we go play some bars and then it's like, Oh cool, those people can we get paid actually to play and then you know, and then people started taking notice and I, I basically went down to like C M J in New York one year with a with a demo CD and like handing it out to people and we got some calls and it was just all really organic. Even yeah. even when we signed a record deal, you know, it was just like, hey guys, we like what you're doing. We don't want to change anything. We'll, you know, when you guys are ready with an album, send it our way and we'll put it out. And that was Sony and they were, they were cool. So we've been kind of lucky because we've never had anyone, you know, asking for demos or this, this song isn't good enough or it's just, you know, it's just been kind of up to our own devices. So if, even if I look back on like the 20 years, no regrets, I'm not angry. <laughs> you know, it's all good. Yeah. Well, you're one of the lucky ones. You know, we hear the horror stories all the time of I know. major labels coming in, and all, all of a sudden you're on that hamster wheel of, well, you got to write a song like this, and, well, that's not good enough. And, you know, we're not going to schedule a release until we, you know, hear this. Yeah. Magical I feel I, I know, man. I hear those all the time, too. And I think we just got lucky where we, every couple of records we had a big enough hit where the record company felt satisfied so i mean who knows how it happened but we uh we skirted all that all that other bullshit yeah well well the name certainly has uh endured and i understand it was named after a poem tell us how you know our lady peace you know r- r- really became the the best you know name for you guys yeah i was really i was in college and i was taking a bunch of literature classes in my uh in my sophomore year and that's when basically the band kind of started and I'd just come from class and had like a, you know, a couple of books on me and uh, it was a poem that we read in class by this guy, you know, famous, actually guy from here, from Boston, Mark Van Doren. And um, yeah, it was just an old war poem that was really cool, had a lot of meaning in terms of like, you know, just trying to, I don't know, get through adversity, you know? And so that, when you think about a band, you're like this little incubator baby and you're trying to make it in the big world and, and that's that kind, of, kind of felt like that, so we went with it. Yeah, well, it's certainly, uh, like I say, uh, you know, it perseveres nicely. There's a lot of bands that uh, got stuck with a, a name they wish they could have changed, and they're forever stuck. So, you know, uh, oh, yeah. it's a yeah. good time. Well, I know you guys have a string of, uh, you know, great records, from Navid to, uh, of course, Clumsy was a, was a highlight for you guys, and I, I know you've uh, done that record in its entirety uh, out there on, on, on the road. What was... You know, what was going on in the band at that time? Do you think those songs really became or re- really endured, you know, through through the years? I don't know. I think after after Naveed, we did a lot of touring on that record, kind of all around the world, because, you know, Starseed kind of got um, got us, put us on the map at least. And then, you know, it was amazing to play with tons of different bands on festivals, especially down in the U.S., you know, all those radio festivals that we used to do. Just seeing other artists and taking it all in, because we hadn't really left Toronto before then, you know, so you just opened up your eyes, you know, and you start where David was like really straight up, just guitar, drums and bass, um, clumsy we added piano and a lot of different guitar effects and really kind of experimented that way and I, I, I think it just had this more artistic kind of flair to it and, you know, the same kind of songs but just with different um, I guess elements added and yeah, for whatever reason, people dug it. Yeah, well I know you've had uh just in, in, incredible experiences out there on the road and, of course, between your headline tours. And I know initially you were uh, out, out there on the Van Halen Balance Tour and 
opening for Page and Plant. What was it like to, you know, be playing amongst, you know, such legendary figures as Robert Plant and was, Jimmy Page yeah. and Eddie Van Halen? <laughs> That was surreal, man. Like I, I, one of the first concerts I ever saw was 1984 with Van Halen. That was a daily rock, but um, you know, and then to have like Robert Plant come up and tell me how much he liked my lyrics, I was just like, you know, I'm, I think about it now. I probably didn't take it in the right way. You know, I was kind of a a young punk and yeah. didn't really, I did, you know, you just don't know back then that like how special those moments were. So if I could do it again, I would probably do it a little, little differently, but still great memories. Yeah, of course. You know, it's uh, it's as as we look back, you know, so much of that music from our our youth becomes a soundtrack to our lives, and it's amazing. Like I say, as you go see some of these, uh, you know, classic bands, and you, you you see like the original fans, you see offspring of them, and then a lot of cases they've had offspring. So there's yeah, three sure. generations, you know, going to going to see a show, you know, these days. Yeah, well, my, yeah, you know what, Jay, my kids wanted to see Tom Petty, you know, and I was like, okay, we're going to try, if I'm, if, you know, try to work it so we can go see those show, one of those shows at the at the Bowl in L.A., and I was like, so bummed that it never happened now, we didn't get a chance to see him, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing, and my yeah. kids love everything from, like, Kendrick to, you know, pop stuff, but they love Tom Petty, and they yeah. kind of discovered him, yeah, you know, so it's just, it's amazing how, how music's out there now, and, and what kids can get into and find. Yeah, well, it's an amazing catalog. Um, I I go back to the uh, 70s, where I actually went to college in Bellingham, you know, just below Vancouver, and I used to be able to pick up Vancouver radio, so I got turned on to a lot of Canadian bands early on, I became the concert promoter for my university there at Western, and you know, oh, worked cool. with Periscope and all the guys in Vancouver and Seattle and all that. And yeah. What amazing times. But um, I had the opportunity to meet and work with Tom Petty on his very first tour. And I know he had stopped at a Vancouver radio station and just just re- remembering how he kept that humbleness, you know, through, through all those years. And, you know, I'm sure there's ups and downs and dark periods and whatever. But, you know, he uh, a lot of these greats, you know, they're... Um, Certainly, very sweet, very humble people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I know you uh, had the opportunity to also play on Woodstock, probably amongst any uh, many more festivals, and of course, it was Woodstock '99. But what 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 is that like to step out on a stage and see this humanity that goes on forever? You know, <laughs> you know what? At some point, it's uh, it you can't even tell the people. You know, it was there was just yeah. so many people when we walked up there. I couldn't believe it. Um, so it's just kind of the blur. Yeah, you know, it's like you're connecting with some of the people in, in the front, but even they're really far away, like the way they had the barricades set up. So, you know, we, and, and look, we were nervous, man. That was like a massive show for us. We, you know, who knew we were going to get to play Woodstock, but it was a, uh, what a thrill, man. I remember uh, there's a couple things I, I did. Uh, I did skydiving, you know, way back in the day, and um, that adrenaline rush was, was pretty intense, and then walking out on stage and went, went for Woodstock, it was pretty close to skydiving. I had that same adrenaline rush. That's amazing. Well, I know through through the years you've had a chance to really experiment. You never want to stay in you know the same place all the time. You're constantly evolving. I know by 2000 you you know worked in the conceptual album with you know spiritual you know machines and all that, and I know it's based on the Ray Kurzweil book and all that, but. You know, I, I, I know some are hills and valleys as far as the commercial acceptance, but why is it important for you to keep trying things and constantly evolve and develop more? How do we how do we try to constantly evolve? Are we asking? Yeah, I mean, what, why is it yeah. important for you to just keep moving I mean, and not repeat yourself? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I maybe sometimes we'll fall. We don't do that when we've had success. We never kind of just go back and follow that blueprint. But I think... I think it is a personal thing where it's like we did that, and when we go back in the studio, we're just looking for like that evolution, like you said. And I think these new this new album, the, the first volume and, and the, the second volume that's going to complete the album in a few weeks when we release it, is really it's it's kind of I guess we've been together long enough now where it's come full circle. So we're not repeating ourselves, but we are going back to some of the earlier sounds. So when you talk about Navid and Clumsy, I think it's an updated version, but it has that energy because we've that stuff is, you know, it's far enough away from us where I think we're comfortable in, like, embracing that, that or some of that stuff again, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, well, tell us now, you know, obviously you've been through the albums, you know, with Bob Rock and, the, you know, the different eras, Healthy and Paranoid Times, where, you know, you had the meddling of the label and, you know, all that. Now now that you're, you know, independent and able to do what you want to do and, and, and really give the people, you know, your true vision, why did you decide to do it in a two-EP form? And tell us about the whole, you know, um, somethingness. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we, we've been writing these songs for a while now. Probably been over the last three years, really just demoing things and getting a collection of songs that we really felt like we were really being hard on ourselves in terms of like, these have to be great. So it took a minute, but we got there. And so we felt like we had five or six. We said, okay, let's, instead of like just going in, like thinking we have 10 or 11 songs or 12 songs and going in the studio for a month, Let's just go try like three or four. So we, we went into Jackson Brown's place, a, a friend of mine that works closely with Rick Rubin. And mm. knows the people there at that studio. Because it's not really a public studio. We got us into that place. And, um, man, it was just a blast to record there because it's Jackson's kind of personal studio. So it's set up mm. to record live. Mm-hmm. So we were able to record everything live off the floor. And the energy was just so sick. So it was a great way to, like, make sure that we were doing the right thing. And, and so... We got out of there with four songs, and um, then we just took a minute to go through the next batch and, and kind of did the same thing. So I, I like breaking it up. It, it, t- it kind of took the pressure off, you know? Yeah, and, and these days, you, you know, people can kind of consume music in smaller bits. It doesn't have to be the album format. You know, you can get, there's really no rules, you know, as long as, you know, it makes sense to you. You can really kind of break it up a little and give the fans, you know, uh, you know a di- different type of experience. Yeah, for me, it's kind of the best of both worlds because you get to, you know, you get the, you get the first EP uh, as a separate thing early, and then you then you get these, you know, get a little bit better, getting the, the second volume coming, and then we're gonna, just, you know, it, it does become a full album at the end of the day. Where we're gonna press it on vinyl, and and um, so you kind of, you know, it, it's like it, it is an album, but you get it in parts, which is kind of cool. Sure, and and besides kind of doing what you want to do in that form. What are some of the other advantages you like of this more indie entrepreneurial world, you know, where it's kind of more direct to the consumer and less to all these gatekeepers? Yeah, I just think you have, you know, we have the, uh, the power to do whatever we want with it. Um, with this first volume we made, kind of like a short film. It's four videos that all intersect and all have some of the same characters and stuff. We're not in it at all. And I think that, you know, that's something that I would just imagine if we said to the record label that, you know, they'd be like, yeah, we're not spending money on that. But we, you know, we're just able to write the checks ourselves and do it and not have to, you know, listen to anyone. So um, those those come out. We actually released the first of those four videos tomorrow. Um, so it's like, yeah, it's just, it's just like our, every little detail we get to take care of and, and not have to really answer to anybody. Well, that's super exciting. As, as, as a music lover, you know that the artist has really given you that undiluted truth, you know, that vision that they have that's not been, you know, soiled by any, you know, corporate or, you know, other other uh, factors. This is probably, yeah, you know what I'm this is probably the most pure musical um, experience we put out there in terms of, you know, the music, and now the video portion of it, the way we're touring, you're right, it's the, it's the most pure we've ever gotten to be, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Now, well, I'll to stay together to do this. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Can't wait to yeah. see you here in L.A. And, you know, coming up with the song list, the set list for your current tour, I mean, you know, what do you look at? Because I know there's, you know, some of the favorites that you got to play. And, you know, how, how do you kind of vary that up with new stuff and, Maybe some deeper cuts. You know, how do you put the set together at this point? Yeah, well, what we're doing, we are. We have promised our fans that the first half of the show is clumsy, back to front, because it's just celebrating the 20th anniversary of that album. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the second half of the set is, you know, we're just trying to change it up every night. Uh, I love social media. For, you know, you see who's coming to the show, and people are, are hitting us up there and asking for certain songs. So sometimes we just we really pay attention to that, flip it around to see what, you know, what, what people are going to be there, what they want to hear, and yeah, I, there's definitely, you know, I, I think I think uh, no one is left unsatisfied. You know, there's, everyone there's going to be something that maybe you don't get to hear, but we're doing enough deep stuff where people feel like shit. I've never heard that live, so that was pretty cool. And how many new songs are you playing on average these days? 
Man, in New York at Irving last night, we played four new songs, which is kind of cool <laughs> because I think people get to hear two from the first volume, and then we're playing two songs that we haven't released yet. So it's kind of cool to hear them before they're out on Spotify or anything. Yeah, it's very exciting. Now, all that you've gone through, all that you've seen, I know the business is constantly evolving, but as far as some of the lessons that you've learned, some of those tips that you can kind of pass on and mentor the next generation, what do you, what do you tell the young creatives that are coming up today? What's, what's really important to focus on? Be an artist. I think problem, the biggest problem I see is I work with a lot of young artists, produce and, and do writing and stuff, and it's like, just be an artist. It's so easy to get caught up into like, oh, I gotta, you know, gotta drive my Facebook and I gotta drive all my my Instagram and Snapchat, all, like all that stuff. And you're so paranoid that that's what's gonna make you successful, mm-hmm. and the art gets left behind because you spend too much time wearing that hat. Yeah, and I think the best the best artist just be an artist. Let find someone else to take care of all that other shit. Sure. Yeah, you could never imagine Prince being the king of Twitter or, you know, <laughs> any of that. I mean, you got to stay in the man. zone to be able to write, you know, great music and, and, and you really... You do, and you got to work. That's it. you got to work at your craft, not work at, you know, getting more Twitter followers. Yeah. Well, again, that's important to kind of build your team and, and have some people around you that do what you don't do so you can stay concentrated on what's important, and that's great content. Yeah, for real. I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying it's not important. I just said... That for the for you as the artist, yeah, you got to find someone else. You got to you got to concentrate on being an artist. Yeah, no, it's 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 got to happen on the team. But like like you say, we we see these artists today. They're the the kings of Instagram. But where's the song? But, yeah, and that's the problem with the music. It's like people are trying to take these people who are semi famous on their socials and make them an artist, and that that doesn't work. Sure. Well, we can't wait to have you out here at the El Rey Theater. I know you're visiting and seeing a lot of, uh, you know, friends out there that haven't seen the band in a minute. And, of course, you know, we're always excited to have you here in the States. OurLadyPeace.net is the website. Rain, it's always a pleasure. Can't wait to see you rock uh, L.A. and California. And please keep making that great music. Thanks, yeah. I appreciate your time, man. Have a great night.